Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Just a Spoon for the podcast that is young and fully sick and live for the first time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this is my first live show in a real life venue. It's very strange to be out of my unit. Um, we're at the Wheeler Center in Melbourne. Um, so happy to be here, and uh, this uh, we're also on the live stream. So where's the camera? Hello, hello to the people that are watching at home. So happy to have you with us. Uh, we are recording on International Day of People with Disability, um, or as I like to call it, Disabled Christmas. Uh, you need to give every disabled person a present. Um, but right now, your presence is a present. <laughs> yeah. And that's setting the bar for this event. Um, yeah, also. <laughs> this event is supported by a City of Melbourne Arts Grant and auspiced by Arts Access Victoria. Very grateful to both of those institutions. Um, I've written a bad joke here that I won't say. Um, <laughs> um, my guests today, I will just quickly introduce my guests because they're very special and very happy to have them here. Um, to the far left, I've got Jess Healy Walton, a queer disabled writer and speaker who co-wrote an episode of the comedy series Get Kraken, uh, which aired on ABC in 2019. Jess is the author of the new graphic novel Stars in Their Eyes and the 2016 children's book Introducing Teddy. They have been published in anthologies, the anthologies Growing Up Disabled in Australia, Funny Bones, and Meet Me at the Intersection, and many other places. We also have here in the middle, Alistair Baldwin Hello. is a writer, comedian, <laughs> thought leader, Thank disabled you. ingenue, he wrote this, yeah. and sometimes blonde. <laughs> Not currently, if to give a visual description, I am unfortunately a brunette white guy in my mid-twenties right now. Look at that. But look, sometimes I am blonde. Look at that brunette guilt, just jumping right in there with the visual description. We'll get there, oh, we'll get there. Next to um, Jess right now, God oh, damn. <laughs> um, he has written for a number of TV shows, including ABC's The Weekly, Hard Quiz, and At Home Alone Together. He is currently a staff writer on the upcoming Amazon original Dead Loch. Did I say that right? I believe so. you tell me. You're a Scottish, no? I am not. I just wish I was. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're nailing it. You're on your path. Thank you. <laughs> I'm on my path. Um, Alistair also co-wrote for Get Kraken. We've got a bit of a Get Kraken family here. Um, and before we get to the main event, the conversation, I would like to acknowledge that this show is happening on the stolen land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. I extend my respect to elders past and present and to any First Nations people listening. Sovereignty was never ceded. Indigenous Australians experience higher rates of disability than the non-Indigenous population, and it makes sense because they live under constant colonial violence. And as we are still in a pandemic, we have taken multiple steps to ensure today's event is as COVID safe as possible. Everyone coming here had to be double vaxxed, and uh, uh, everybody, oops, sorry, we're not wearing, well, Je Jess is wearing a mask, but uh, everybody else is masked up. Uh, because it's not just about protecting ourselves, it's about ensuring that the most vulnerable people still have access as we go forward. As American disability activist Alice Wong says, access is love. And I love these two people. <laughs> so let's get to it. Um, and I think we should give uh, Jess and Alistair a round of applause. <laughs> And I would like to applaud all of you for coming out today. Thank you so much. For anyone who's watching or listening from outside Melbourne, um, the, we're all quite traumatized and it's very strange to, um, to be out of our houses and especially in a big room with strangers. So I really appreciate you coming out. Thank you. Let's get to it. Um, so if anyone's not familiar with this podcast, basically I usually bring on a different guest each episode. Um, all of my guests are disabled uh, or chronically ill or both. Um, the reason I say or both is because you can be disabled and not chronically ill and you can also be chronically ill and not disabled. You can be both. You can be like lots of combinations. I just want to make sure everyone's aware of that. Um, I'm both. Uh, and what else? Um, everyone you hear speaking on this podcast is... a. Uh, I say I, the, the tagline is a young, young person living with chronic illness and or disability, um, but I'm 35 now, 
So I'm starting to be like, can I still say young on this podcast? <laughs> um, I think the National Young Writers Festival cutoff is 35. I performed oh, no. at it about a month ago, and I was like, this is my last hurrah. <laughs> <Brutal. laughs> That's it. I'm out. Yeah, I don't it, think you have to count the last two years. <laughs> oh, yeah? Wait, can you keep going to 37? Like, is there a margin? I hope yeah. so, because I'm 37, so I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we brought Alistair in to, like, bring the yeah. collective age down. Um, well, yeah. And also, you never... Yeah, maybe it's ableist to people with dyscalculia to have a hyperfixation on arbitrary constructs of time, and I think you have a useful energy, Caitlin, and I think that's enough. Look at him go. Look at him go. Yeah, yeah, no, no, there's people Thank applauding. You. Yeah. The defense rests. Oh, that's fantastic. I just realized we didn't do visual descriptions except Alistair. Um, so <laughs> I, and I mainly told you what I'm not looking like right now. Yes, don't get an image of a blonde person. Uh, <laughs> I have blonde in my hair, but it's up in a bun, so nobody knows. Um, I think a lot of us have color growing out because of lock, all the lockdowns. <laughs> um, so uh, I'll go first. I am a uh, white person. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to do this. I'm a white person with a brown fringe and glasses. I'm wearing a white outfit and brown boots and I'm sitting with my legs crossed. Um, is that it? That's all I need to do really, isn't it? Alistair, go for yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a white guy in his mid-twenties who's wearing glasses. I have brown hair. Uh, I'm wearing jeans, <laughs> um, blue jeans Deep and a blue sigh. shirt and I'm wearing AFO leg braces that I've customised with uh, the limited release washi tape that Liminal Magazine have recently released oh. with a bunch of, um, I believe, like yuzu little citrus print on it and it's very cute. A literal hush fell over the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. <laughs> no, I only recently discovered the power of washi tape for customising mobility aids. I think it's a great really? product. Next, I'm going to get some holographic or like glow in the dark washi to uh, again, a hush. A hush, wow. Getting like real panto vibes, and please keep it up. It's amazing. Um, <laughs> Jess, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, so, I'm a fat white agender person uh, with one leg amputated above the knee, and um, I'm wearing a, a blue top and a badge that says disabled dragon with a little picture of a disabled dragon on it. I've got my um, crutches next to me, and in front of the stage is my wheelchair, the beast. The beast. Hell yeah. Which we tried to get up on the stage, but too the big. beast was too beastly. <laughs> <laughs> too beastly. <laughs> too beastly. <laughs> well, I think we should get started by acknowledging the, um, <laughs> the hippo in the room, only because I read your story in Growing Up Disabled in Australia earlier today, Alistair, oh. and it is about... <laughs> Hippotherapy, which has nothing to do with hippos, um, <laughs> but we'll get to that. Um, so we were all involved with an episode of the TV show Get Crackin', which was on uh, Australian television a couple years ago. Um, I played an integral role. Um, <laughs> I have people come up to me in the street and they say, oh my God, <laughs> weren't you on Get Crackin'? You were the only thing I remember, right? I know. Um, Alistair, I think, was in it too, but I know we Briefly. Well, no one remembers because I wasn't holding an adorable puppy, <laughs> Labrador. Oh. I, was, so I, was holding, I was holding a guide dog puppy. Um, in the episode, I was playing delivery person number one, can I just say? <laughs> yeah, where's um, that other guy now? <laughs> nowhere. I'm always watching TV and I'm like, he's nowhere. He's nowhere. Do you know what? He was originally delivery person one. <laughs> and I got, oh my I got God. promoted on the day, so... <laughs> you black swan him? <laughs> Um, I'll, I'll black swan you all eventually. <laughs> That's how um, I became disabled, actually. <laughs> Pushed me off the stage when I was doing Swan Lake. <laughs> That's how I lost he, my leg, too. Yeah. <laughs> we all What's have a Caitlin funny, story. They both have exactly the same story, and both of them fell backwards off the stage, and they, then they quietly said, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> And if we don't do that tonight, we'll know that this podcast is a failure. <laughs> <laughs> We're like setting the bar high. It's good. Um, it's oh, sorry. Can I just, just because I'm so, the guild will kick me out if I don't absolutely clarify that Jess is a co-writer on the episode and they co-wrote it with the Kate and then I did additional writing and I just uh -huh. you're American you know all about stolen valor I just didn't want to <laughs> seem you're like 
I, out in of a, nowhere. To, uh, <laughs> it's so tough. Someone was telling me that they got really into like stolen valor TikToks or whatever of people confronting like fake <laughs> veterans. <laughs> And anyway, that's neither here nor there. But I'm sorry. Did I you just, just want to tell everyone that I'm a fake veteran. No, no, no. I just mean it's a big thing in America. I I'm think. a real non-veteran, just for the record. I know. I, <laughs> I don't want to make you have to have stolen valor. But I'd, I'd love to clarify that um, while we did work and collaborate together, I think um, to sh should we should rank each other. Well, I, I, I was It's actually, my point. I'm into hierarchy. I was, I was joking before, I was, but I was going to get to this. So I, I was very small feature, featured extra or something. <laughs> um, but really, Jess was the, the genius behind that episode, which, by the way, I just, just for anyone who's not familiar with it, it was an episode of Get Cracking, which was a... Um, I probably should let you <laughs> do explain this, actually. No, no, do it, do it for me. I like this. <laughs> it was a genius. Um, it actually was, though. It was, uh, so Get Cracking, if you're not familiar, it was uh, Kate McLennan and Kate McCartney created it. They're two brilliant comedy minds. And it was a uh, parody of a morning of a very, very early breakfast television show that's so early that it's, like, still the night before. Um, and they're the sort of two unhinged hosts. And... Um, there was one episode which was sort of like a, a send up of the, um, you know, the token day where everyone acknowledges disabled people. Mm. Like it's like inter international <laughs> day, which today is the real international day of people with disability. It's just a mouthful. Um, and so I actually spoke to the Kates at one of the one of the after parties. <laughs> one of. Um, I really I milked that extra roll like for all it was worth. Um, but uh, they were telling me that they sort of reached out to Jess knowing that, that they were such a good writer and they were like, we need to have a disabled person working on this episode. Like, it can't just be two non-disabled people writing it. And they were like, um, Jess, do you want to write some jokes for this? This is the way they tell it. They told it to me. They're like, Jess, do you want to write some jokes for this? And Jess, like, sent them back a whole episode. Like, basically, mm. like, just... And they were like, it was just gold. Um, so... I was watching the episode and I remember like leaning over to you and going like, oh my God, like there's a bit, there's like a transitional joke, like visual joke where it's like a walking stick and you're trying to lean it against a wall and it keeps like falling down. Because <laughs> there's just like, what do you do with your walking stick when you're not holding it? It's so hard to organize. And I leaned over and I was like, that happens to me all the time. And Jess was like, I wrote that. <laughs> uh, right, did I, I write that? I forget. I think you did. Oh, we both I, have not to, loss. now Jess is actually doing Stolen oh, Valor. No. I actually oh, wrote, wrote that. I wrote oh that book. Uh, <laughs> the American in me. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm unstoppable. Not to, I'm fairly certain. I mean, in the writer's room, everything's... But I'm pretty certain. Because <laughs> I was... Into, I, did, I did a lot of those bumpers and, I like, a lot of those ticker jokes as well. And they were so good. That yeah. kind of stuff. But, yeah, but okay, the well fact that you... Maybe Jess them, said that happens to me, too. Maybe that's what happened. <laughs> My crutches do constantly fall over. So that might have been the conversation. Because I... It's a, a constant frustration to me. And I've started, um, I've got a crutches bag on the back of my wheelchair and I've started to put attachments on tables and chairs and all those sorts of things to kind of hold the crutches because it's just such a constant irritation, the crashing and then the yeah. having to bend down and try to pick them up again. It's just a, it's a yeah. pain. Oh, pain the bending the down to pick them up part. It's yeah. like, no, I need them to do this. Oh, it's yeah. Just yeah, they're there to make me nightmare. move, like, you know, to make movement easier, not to have me going... Ugh! <laughs> so I'm really curious, Jess, what was it like on your end? You know, did you already know the Kates? Like, did they reach out to you? I mean, uh, I only knew the Kates through their incredible and hilarious work. So I was a huge fan um, of both of their series. And I, I um, couldn't quite believe it when they reached out through Twitter um, to say, did I want to come up with an idea for a sketch or write a couple of jokes? And... Um, the only reason that I tried writing an episode is that I thought, well, this might be... At the time, I was um, exploring writing poetry and short stories and a whole lot of different sort of um, forms of writing that I hadn't tried before. And I thought, well, this is my opportunity to have a go at writing a script. And I never intended to send them a finished episode script. I just thought, I will write out the episode, and in doing that, I will find a few jokes and ideas in the script that I can then send to them. Uh, and then I quite liked the idea for the structure of the episode and I thought, well, there's probably a lot of rubbish in there, but the structure idea is good. Um, and there are maybe a few jokes in there that are okay. Um, 
And so I just thought, well, it can't hurt to send them the whole thing and say, take what you will. Um, yeah, and they liked it. They liked parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> they really uh, liked it. They were raving about you a lot, yeah. like backstage. But yeah. I basically Googled how, how to write a TV script because I'd never done it before. Um, <laughs> and the BBC had some TV scripts up on their website. And so I just started reading through those and looking at how they were laid out and everything. Um, which goes to show if, you know, you were discouraged from studying creative writing at uni uh, like I was and did journalism instead and hated it and dropped out and did an arts degree, uh, then Look, you can still just it. Google how to do this. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes it might work. <laughs> Literally while producing this event, they were like, can you send through a run sheet? And I Googled how to write a run sheet. <laughs> It's our greatest resource. Um, yeah. We actually have a Bachelor of Screenwriting here on the I stage. I know. <laughs> Think of the money I would have saved if I just Googled screenwriting. <laughs> I'm looking at my hex chat now and being like, fucking hell. <laughs> I'm sure it was worth it though, because like, look at you go. You're writing for all these TV shows. Uh, you had a th theatre, Is it was lame theatre or was it more like a solo show? Like, how do you... Yes, well... Yeah, it's I. It was a great degree, and I love screenwriting. And I'm getting more into playwriting actually. So I was very blessed to also do some work with MTC first, an initial thing that they ran with EWF to write like a 12-minute short play, and then do a sort of semi-staged reading at um, the oh. Melbourne Theatre Company, and that was really great. And that was called Lame, and it was essentially about like two disabled friends who get invited to their old high school bullies uh, house party um, and because disability is cool now, essentially, <laughs> but also maybe because yeah. this high school bully is trying to insulate herself from uh, getting cancelled. Um, <laughs> and then great. that led to a great... Um, I did uh, another thing with MTC, Cybeck Electric, and then I wrote a sexy romp uh, set at a... Uh, medical conference about a doctor and his former patient and the doctor is now the world's leading expert in this patient's rare disease and then they have a one-night stand it's all about how um how different sexual attraction and medical curiosity is because I don't know if you obviously disabled people get stared at a lot in public but if you're gay staring is part of cruising and so you never quite know <laughs> Whether someone is like trying to fuck you or they just want to know why you're limping. Right. So the synergy of you're that. Like, which kink is it, right? Absolutely. Because yeah. <laughs> um, if you're a, if you're a queer woman like I am, if you're just staring, they're just like my new best friend, and you're like, oh, <laughs> another friend, I guess. <laughs> no, men. Uh, if a man stares at you, if two men stare at each other for more than three seconds, <laughs> that they're going to have sex. <laughs> <laughs> One second to three seconds is the safe zone for um, <laughs> cis hetero guys <laughs> to look at each other. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. I'm, yeah. I'm learning so much. Um, <laughs> where, were, where, where were we? So I, I guess like um, I'm really interested in this sort of different but in my, on my podcast, I've talked to a lot of different people about their creative process. I'm also really interested in like how people get into what they're doing because there's no one path through the creative industries. Um, and I, I think it's really interesting that we've got Jess who's come to it like in your 30s, kind of Googling how to write a script. And then Alistair, like, did you kind of come out of high school being like, this is what I'm going to do? Kind of. I'm very, I, every day I feel very blessed that I kind of early on knew exactly what I wanted to be and then kind of was able to get there relatively quickly. But essentially, you know, when you're like born with a physical disability, you're often like reading books when the other kids are doing PE. So I was always like a bit ahead as a reader from my peers, which I think translates to being a good writer. And then at uh, the age of 13, I won... Um, classic purse reference, the Tim Winton Young Writers Award. Get out. <laughs> For real. Um, and That's impressive. I'm from yeah. Perth as well. <laughs> I know. I went to Subiaco Library. No way. Subiaco? Won... <laughs> oh, this is not interesting for anyone else. From the, yeah, in the lower secondary category, I wrote a weird... I was such like a weird creep or whatever. I wrote a short story about a guy who sort of 
he like, I don't know, his wife died and then he had a weird twitch in his eye. And so, and the twitch was sort of, it was like a very Edgar Allan Poe, like beating heart sort of thing that was sort of making him lose touch with reality. And then, so he like got a, I'm so sorry if this is kind of graphic body image stuff, but then he like, <laughs> What else is he going to get a spoon with to get rid of this twitch in his eye? He gets rid of his eye, but then he misses the twitch. And then so he puts, he like jams like the like um, watch of his dead wife into the socket. And then the tick of it is reminiscent of the twitch. And then, and Tim Winton was this like, at... this is compelling <laughs> stuff. This is so up Tim Winton's alley, by the I way. I know, <laughs> I know. And then they were at the ocean as well. And I was, was going to say, yeah. Mateship and masculinity and all then that Then there was shit. a psychedelic episode on the Swan River. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Like, that, that's amazing. You wrote that at 13. Yeah. And then, but the problem, I think, is that I, when you give a child that much validation early <laughs> on, they are going to chase that for the rest of their life, which mm -hmm. sort of made me be like, I can probably do a BFA and have a career. And I was, I'm very extremely privileged that I have, but yeah, I think I'm, I got a lot of uh, external validation very young, which also, I mean, it is kind of interesting being like a child with a disability. I feel like you do get a lot of attention very young or whatever, or like as a kid, I'd like walk into PMH and my neurologist would be like, you're simply fascinating. Can I bring in the student doctors to look at you? And then I was like, I'm a child star. And <laughs> I sort of, disability, I think, can breed a degree of, um, in my case, narcissism, which mm -hmm. I think is uh, not our fault, so you can't be mad at me about it. But, <laughs> but yeah. Especially not today. This is our day. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I like, yeah, I got, I always loved writing as a kid, and then I applied to do screenwriting at VCA, and then in, like, my honours year, I got... Uh, an internship on the weekly and then the internship turned into a full-time job and then I also got DM'd by the Capes <laughs> asking to write which you know I mean just created the necessity <laughs> to yes. cast more than one token disabled writer by creating a whole episode that needed content so I'm so much of my current career is actually indebted to you for being like I'm gonna google how to write a full episode of television <laughs> Um, and this guy's I'm over sorry. here doing doing <laughs> honors in screenwriting. He's like, I know. Oh, if man. you look, I'm not going to read out my hex debt right now, but it is <laughs> embarrassing. I'm <laughs> trying to forget mine, but I just wanted to say I actually owe bo a lot to both of you because I'm going to try and remember the whole sequence of events. Well, you actually, I don't remember how we met Alistair, but you invited me, uh, I don't know how you knew about me, but you invited me to be, uh, to do a set on in Lemon Comedy. Oh, of at course. The, at the Melbourne International Comedy Festival like years ago, which um, was so fun. And Lemon was this sort of space where it was um, specific, uh, it, well, I should not explain yeah. it to you, but uh, what was Lemon exactly? Well, yeah, it was just uh, like an inclusive comedy night where a lot of comedy nights now have gotten much better, but this was like at Hairs and Hyenas and it was a f accessible, diverse comedy <laughs> night, <laughs> which at the time was um, unique. I feel like um, it's still kind of unique. A little bit. There's lots of great stuff now, like scout voxels, hairbrush comedy and other stuff, but this was like, there's so few like wheelchair accessible comedy gigs in like venues in the city. And so it was just this really amazing sort of gig that I like hosted for a while, like this monthly show. And yeah, we had all these amazing, you know, comedians of color and queer comedians and disabled comedians. And yeah, if memory serves, you crushed it. Oh, thank you. Well, it was nice because it was so lovely to go to a room and just know that you're probably not going to hear just hate speech yelled at you. <laughs> like, because I mean, you know, we've all we've all been to rooms where that happens. Um, but it was so much fun, and it was the show I did was actually in the Imperial, so I got to like be like. Uh, I mean, it's like one of the only stand-up sets I've ever done, but I got, I got to be like, I've performed at the MP during you know, my <laughs> MICF, and it's like, once for five minutes. Um, <laughs> now that's it, stolen valor. That's that the it, definition oh God, of stolen is, valor. I'm going to have to change my like, <laughs> bio to just steals valor. Um, but so what happened was, uh, uh, 
I, I asked someone, I asked one of the other comedians to just do a little, film a little bit of me because I have a Patreon, by the way. Thank you to all my Patreon subscribers uh, who are, some, some of whom are here and are watching. Um, basically, they've been supporting me for years like because the disability support pension is not a lot. <laughs> um, so they, I've been able to like work on my own projects and like write jokes and stuff sometimes because I have that extra money. Anyway, so I was like, can you just take a little bit of a video of my set just so I can post on Patreon and be like, look, guys, I do stuff um, because they never hear from me and they keep giving me their money. Um, and uh, and then, uh, gosh, months later, I got a DM from from old Jess Healy Walton over here being like, can you send me through it? Do you have a video of that? And I was like, I actually do. And so I guess the Kates watched it and were like, well, Caitlin's not awful. Um, <laughs> We might put her on television for a couple seconds. Um, so I have both of you to thank because like, uh, and I just, this is just what I love is I just love like disabled people, not just disabled people, but I love like the kind of reaching out and pulling each other up with us and the sharing of opportunities. And um, this podcast has been a lot of, not to like brag, but like this podcast has been like, I wanted to see more platforms for disabled people, especially young disabled people, because a lot of people have the idea that you either grow out of disability or you age into it. But there's a lot of us that just like are in the middle mm -hmm. um, and uh, we continue to exist and have lives and be interesting people uh, in our own rights. Anyway, I'm just on my platform, I'm just on my, uh, Soapbox now, I'm going to get off it. Uh. No, well, I was a fan of this podcast well before we ever met. I think maybe that's Is that how why I reached out. I literally or maybe you are at a quippings and then we I met. or did do a quippings. That was fun. I but did, no, but I love... I did a rap. <laughs> oh, yeah. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. I probably shouldn't have done it. No. <laughs> but it was, it was a rap about being chronically ill. I don't know yeah. if it was a rap so much as I was just talking very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and even then, talking quickly for a chronically ill person is more of a freeform scat. I <laughs> do remember. Word. I remember, like the Auslan interpreter afterwards was like heaving next to the stage. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. Um, yeah, good things like that. Like, but hairs, uh, quippings at hairs and hyena. Uh, was like one of the few, one of the few accessible venues and like queer friendly spaces. And it was one of the first times, gen genuinely one of the first times that I had ever been in a room with like all, majority if not all disabled people and uh, disabled artists no less. And it was exhilarating. Mm. And then when I got to go on, I think the, the next time I felt that was when I was um, on set for that Get Kraken episode because there were lots of disabled people cast on that episode. You know, characters, quirky characters popping in. There was a band of an uh, uh, choir, I think, of sisters, sisters, sisters of, of invention. invention. Sisters of sisterhood, of, sisterhood of invention. Anyway. Sisters of invention. Sorry, a real sorry. amazing pop group that yes. I still Fantastic. listen to on Spotify every <laughs> week. That's awesome. Um, they yeah, they were so cool, and I got to be in like makeup chairs next to them. Just, just like even like being in the green room with my scene partner. And not having to like do that extra layer of explanation about yourself that you kind of have to do sometimes. Like it was just all disabled people, and we were all just like, and like all different disability, all different conditions and like appearances. And you, you don't have to be like, um, I don't know. You don't have to go through like the extra spiel that you, everyone was mm. just like, no yeah. disabled. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> even though we were all so different. Um, Anyway, so uh, that was a wonderful experience for me. And I'm really, I, I've been curious ever since, like, how it was for you two. Um, Jess, we haven't, I've, I've when I was, uh, talked over you a bit. So. No, when I was sitting in the cafe, uh, my local cafe, working on the script for the episode, um, it felt like just this very kind of, you know, as I, I keep saying, I just Googled how to do it. I didn't know what I was doing. I was just, like, putting down some tentative ideas and then... Um, the Kate said, you want to come in and work on the episode with us and do some writing? Um, and I was just like trying not to vomit all the way there because I was so terrified of even being around these amazing people that I had, you know, admired uh, as a, a fan for such a long time. Um, and I got in there and they were just so down to earth and like the first five minutes was very awkward, me just being like, oh my God, I can't believe I'm here. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And then, you know, they kind of eased me into it and it was great. Um, 
and you know, I got to, to work on some scenes with them there. Um, but then there's something completely different about being on set and all of a sudden these characters that you've written um, are being played by real people and you know, you've written all these disabled characters and they're all being played by disabled people so you are literally surrounded by disabled people. Um, and you know the Kates even cast disabled people for the very few non-disabled roles that were in the episode. So it was really, um, so everyone apart from the Kates on set, you know, was disabled and it was just, um, uh, yeah, a very powerful emotional experience. And to get to sit back and watch people saying some words that you've written, um, I can never remember which bits. <laughs> so um, at some point, Alistair and I are going to have to go through the script with <laughs> two yeah. colours highlighters and try and work out which bits were ours. Um, but but to, to see that episode, that was kind of this little idea um, that I'd had, um, yeah, being played out by all these really talented people was surreal, but really mm. lovely. Yeah. And when you were writing it, were you sort of putting in stuff that for years you'd kind of been like yes. marinating on and being like, <laughs> yes. if I ever get the chance to put something on TV, I'm going to complain about this. Like, was that sort of motivating you? Absolutely. Or? So things that had pissed me off for like a very long time, you know, I'd, I'd built up a lot of resentment from the age of nine to the age of, you know, 35, I think I was when I was working on it. So it was still like... Still young, young, it's still yeah. young. <laughs> many, many years of uh, ableism, internalised ableism, being made into an inspiration object, mm. uh, being pitied, being, uh, yeah, um, being excluded, being unable to get into places because of access. Um, and I, it's funny now because I'm using the base, the wheelchair for the last couple of years, particularly during lockdown since I wrote the episode. Um, and the amount of shops just on my way here that I couldn't get into um, because the entrances weren't accessible or I could get into the entrance but the aisle way, aisles weren't accessible. Um, and you just, you get this, this feeling of real anger. You know, even the lifts in Melbourne Central, they were all out of order and I had to go to the other side of the station, go up one level, go to the other side of the station because the lifts from that level were broken, go the other side, go up another level and then there was a sign saying, do you want to go to the next level? <laughs> you have to go, you know, it says, you know, <laughs> go to. down the other end of such and such a shop and through this other shop and you'll find us, find the lifts. And I, I couldn't find them. So I came back to the sign where there was a phone number that you could call if you couldn't find them. And I've been in two different sets of lifts and I'm trying to find the third lift. And I called the number and I said, I can't find the lift and your sign is fucking ridiculous. What is going on? Um, you know, it said, you know, go through black and pink or something. It's the name of a shop. <laughs> Just like, what? Uh, and she was like, well, actually, you need to go back down where you were, but there's a small corridor to your right. It's not very visible. And the lifts are down that corridor. I can come down there and show you. And I'm like, you could or you could get someone to make a decent sign yeah. that will help every disabled person get there because I can tell you, you're going to have more calls. So mm. I said, no, don't come down here. You tell me how to get there and I will try and get there. And if I can't, I'm gonna call you again. Uh, and in the end, I found the very small corridor. It was a very small corridor. It was very hard to see. <laughs> and I went in my third set of lists and then I was able to get out to the street level. So there's just, you have all of these experiences that kind of build up in you and like, like they're and horrible. Like this, is, this is just on, this just happened to you on your way here. Yeah, just today. today. Like, yeah. This is like the last hour of your life. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, I was messaging Caitlin, I'm trapped in Melbourne Central, currently <laughs> trying to escape, you know, I've had, I've had fur, I've had good coffee, but I can't get out of here. <laughs> Uh, and I was messaging back going, my, my rideshare driver saw me and then drove off, so I'm running late. So yeah, we've, we've, we were running on crip time today for sure. Yeah, some, of, some of crip time is because you're, you know, sore or chronically ill or you, you know, having medical issues that are, you know, stopping you from getting up and out the door. And sometimes it's just the inaccessibility of things and the completely ridiculous situations that you find yourself in. And I actually left home at two o'clock today to get here at seven because I was taking my wheelchair out for the first time in about two years, you know, I've been using it around home and just my local streets in Pakenham. And 
Um, I know all my routes and I know exactly where I take it and how to get there. And I thought, well, this time I'm taking a train into the city and that's a different thing. Um, and I knew that it was just going to be tricky. And on the way home, there's, you know, train work. So I'm going to have to get out, off at Caulfield and I think you get like a special car that takes you to the next station, maybe. You've got to wait for it to arrive. Last time I tried to do that, I had a lot of trouble. So I'm feeling quite nervous about that. And it'll take me to Westall, then I'll get out of that car, back onto the train and then get out at Pakenham. So there's just a lot of things, whether it's taxis or you know, alternative rides for train works or getting trapped in Melbourne Central. You know, there's lots of things you have to kind of allow extra time for. Mm -hmm. And I think that's part of what makes Crip Time so special is that mostly it's non-disabled people's fault. So, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, and I thought that was something really uh, clever that, that I, I don't know who came up with this, but in, in the episode <laughs> of, of Get Cracking. <laughs> Um, it was incredible <laughs> because they, the state they had like a two or three level stage with no ramp up to it, and I think wasn't there like a ramp that went to nowhere or yeah. something? It was just like the set was one yeah. big visual joke, and the more you looked at it, the more there was. I met one of my favorite things that I still like sometimes go back to that episode and look at this and just crack up was like um, one of those sort of 3D light up signs, but it was braille. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I just was, I just could not stop laughing at that. Um, and and it's, but it's it's true uh, what you were saying before. Um, they cast uh, me and this other actor in non-disabled roles. Um, so, uh, but like I had t I had a fall like I think the week or two before a shooting. Um, and uh, speaking of inaccessibility, I fell like walking back from the shops near my house because the pavement was uneven and um, I was holding groceries in both hands, which I don't do anymore, I have a backpack. Um, ever since then I'm like, backpack, <laughs> do not hold things in your hands because I had no way of stopping myself from falling, so I just went like straight down like a board on my face. I like to say I broke the fall with my nose. Um, <laughs> and. Um, uh, you know, I had a, a the, so then I'm sitting in the makeup chair next to like Kate McLennan, Kate McCartney, and the, the the poor woman has to cover up my black eye, uh. <laughs> and um, and I had a like my arm was broken, so um, but they were like, I, I was like, there's no way I'm gonna like lose this opportunity, so I was holding a a really quite mature puppy, <laughs> um, a dog, oh if you will. it was, it was all, <laughs> because at that age they failed out of being guide dog yeah. puppies, and that's when they go into acting. <laughs> Um, so it wasn't, a, it wasn't a young puppy. Um, and uh, and I was, if you look at the, if you look at like, I'm holding it with one arm and I'm just sort of like, like leaning it on the other arm. Um, yeah, so uh, <laughs> that was like, and I remember between takes, they had to get like an assistant, a production assistant to like hold the puppy for me because I would just be like, da 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 da. And I'd go off backstage and I'd be like, <laughs> <laughs> And something that I was really interested in talking to you both about was um, the uh, talking to the, some of the producers, like at the, like afterwards after shooting that episode, because uh, my shoot time, my my like time being on set was like really early in the day, and that really messes me up. I am uh, because of my chronic illness and a lot of like different things. I'm I'm probably most um, lucid around like. 9 p.m. at night, unfortunately, um, and but in the mornings, I, it's like I'm it's like I'm walking dead, and um, they were like, you know, your call time is like 7 a.m. in like South Bank, and uh, I, I was in a lot of pain. I was in a lot of physical pain when I got there, and I was talking to them afterwards about it, and they said that they had chosen early call times because they had some, they'd spoken to like one chronically ill person who'd said my medications kick in in the morning, so the mornings are great for me, you should make it in the morning. <laughs> and I was like, well, that doesn't work for me at all. <laughs> um, but they didn't know. And it, yeah. But I didn't realize, because I'm so used to just taking whatever's offered <laughs> when it comes <laughs> to work opportunities, I didn't, re and like never complain, because you don't really want to be, even if they, I'm more open about being disabled now when I'm going for roles, but you don't want to like be difficult. Uh, I'm still struggling with that mm. kind of internalized ableism of like I don't want to be difficult. I just say yes to everything and smile. Don't don't be too don't make it too obvious that you're like you know not an able person. Um, apparently, they were actually like trying to make the production more comfortable for disabled people, but obviously like it's very hard because we're all 
you know, as diverse as like humans are. Mm. Um, uh, I guess like like what was like, like what was your experience like? Um, you know, I guess I guess I'm interested in like what worked. What would you, if you mm. know, you're both looking to keep working in this sort of arena. What what's what's like some good basics? Well, a lot of. Um opportunities as a screenwriter I mean you have a lot more experience with this Alistair but a lot of the things I've looked at where you know you're entry level and you're just getting started out writing for a show you know you've got to intern and it's full time and it's long hours or you've got to you know go to a diversity initiative you might get into a you know a camp or an internship or something through um, an organization um, but you've still got to be there in person full time five days a week and I just think that's, and you know, there's no opportunities if you have a pain flare or a medical appointment or if you're um, housebound or bedridden to be able to participate in those opportunities. So, um, and that's before I even get started on, you know, being a parent of young children and, you know, the fact that I have to do school, drop off and pick up every day, um, you know, and that just completely wipes me. It takes all of my energy. Um, so, and, and also I have to pay my bills and, you know, feed my kids. And so doing like unpaid opportunities full time is not really a possibility. So um, I wouldn't have got into the industry if it wasn't for the Kates reaching out and saying, do you want to do this on your own time at home when you feel like it, send it in whenever they're ready and hey, we're excited to work with you. So that was um, a different kind of experience as opposed to a lot of people that are trying to break into the industry. So I completely see where you're coming from in terms of trying not to come across as too disabled or too difficult or needing too much um, or needing them to change anything. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it did seem like the Kates were really um, committed to the idea of making the set as accessible as possible and making the process of writing and acting the show as accessible as possible. Um, and they did a lot of asking people questions about what would work and, you know, I think the more those questions are asked and we just get past the idea of this needs to be perfect and just start with the ask what people need and then respond to that, um, the more disabled people will be able to get into the industry. So, you know, mm. if you're running a diversity initiative, make it available online. You know, this event is being run in person and online. And I mean, that's my love language. That's, you know, music to my ears. I'm like, yes, I just need flexibility. If I have a pain flare, I need to be able to, at the last minute to change to attending something online. Um, those sorts of things are important for me, but for another disabled person, it'll be something else. And so non-disabled people have to get used to the idea that we are a big diverse bunch. And if they want to include us, then they need to listen to a wide range of people on what we need. Um, I, but a ramp will do it. Just put a ramp in, right? A ramp. <laughs> One ramp done. That's everyone right. covered. <laughs> And I was land interpreter for one night of your comedy festival run, that kind of thing. <laughs> oh, God. Um, That's awful. Well, I, I really hope that, like, hybrid online in-person events will become the norm. Mm. But we'll yeah, see. I really hope Well, so. even the ramps aren't the norm. <laughs> I mean, yeah. like, yes. they can't even get that right. There's That's no the ramp. thing that people always point out is, like, the just put in a ramp. But, I mean, I there's a lot of places without a ramp. <laughs> yeah. The, yeah, the emoji for disability is a wheelchair. And so that's... But even that... Those needs aren't being met in. Yeah. Many Every time I see that damn emoji, because they changed it, which I get why they did it, but like a few years oh. ago, they changed it from a, a person sitting in a wheelchair to a person like actually leaning forward, like like a, like in a, like a pa Paralympian sort of like. Yeah. But like the thing is that I do sit passively in a wheelchair. That's the whole point: is I'm too tired to move my own body by my own power. Uh, every time I see it, I'm like. Yeah, that's me. <laughs> I know. Just uh, so strong. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It felt like they were trying to be like, disabled people can be energetic. And it's like, <laughs> some of them, yeah. Yeah, like the, the ones <laughs> see that the are the ability. <laughs> yeah. I really want to see an Olympic, Paralympics event where it's just like really, really tired people doing something. Oh, just like I know. Paying, pay, you know what? Paying invoices, just like while you're in a flare. <laughs> That should be an event. Yeah. <laughs> that should be an event. I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> lifting a podcast. <laughs> should be an event. Please, finally, I'll, I might yeah, actually. No. <laughs> imagine if I didn't qualify. I'd be so upset. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> um, and I'm just aware of the time, so I'm just like, 
uh, what else can what, I make sure we get to everything? Normally, when I record these, I just let the conversation spin out. Like I'm a long talker, as they say on Seinfeld, and uh, <laughs> classic reference. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I find it very hard to be brief. So we were just doing this, and the reason that this event actually it's kind of it's kind of interesting to get behind the scenes on this because we are talking about accessibility. The reason this event is only 60 minutes is because the longer you go. You know, you, you know, you need to hire a second Auslan interpreter to sub to sub in because you can't have an Auslan interpreter going for more than sixty minutes at a time. It's just a lot. Um, you know, you got to hire a live caption. We have a live captioner doing our captions today. Thank you very much to our captioner, um, and that means that we're not using like an artificial intelligence program, which is how you get like captions, um, where you know half the words. I've watched. I watch a lot of TV with captions on, closed captions, and got like. If, if I couldn't also hear what people were saying, I'd have no clue what was going on. Um, so yeah, you know, using, we're actually hiring a real life person who is sitting in remote and doing remote work in, in their home somewhere and is uh, listening to us and then typing out the captions. Oh, it's weird how meta, they're, they're typing this up. Hello. <laughs> they're typing this up. You're doing a great job, thank you. Um, and you know, and of course we have Glenda, our lovely Auslan interpreter to, to my left here. Um, and, uh, you know, finding a venue that's accessible, and then you've got to do, if you want to do hybrid events so that you have the live, like online live stream as well, um, that costs extra. And then of course, if I was going to do two hours, it was like kind of doubling all the costs. So um, this was just like, this event is like hopefully first of many for me, because um, I really enjoy producing it. Um, but I, I think like, it wasn't actually as expensive as I think people in the arts think. They're always like, oh, it's like, well, how come you didn't do this access uh, requirement, this access requirement? They're always like, oh, so expensive. Um, and I mean, it's like, it's doable. And I think it's, I think something that we need to, I think a lot of time, sorry, I'm just monologuing at this point. Go off Do queen. it. <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> but, <laughs> <Woo>. but, <laughs> but I think that a lot of time, especially on days like today, like P uh, Disability Day, we spend a lot of time trying to prove why you know, disabled people are talented and why you're missing out on talent if you don't include us. But honestly, it should just be as simple as it's a human right. Mm. Access is love and you should just, um, everybody should have access. Also, and like you bitches had it during the lockdown. Oh. Like, oh. like don't take it away from us now. We are used to <laughs> having it all of a sudden because you guys needed it. So it's like, don't you dare take it back again. I mean, fucking housebound for years, you jerks. Yeah. <laughs> then they, they literally after two weeks, they were all baking bread and losing their minds. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, years I've been doing this <laughs> alone with like no one to commiserate with. Oh my God. Anyway, we won't go there. Uh, <laughs> um, before, well, we've only got 12 minutes left. Is there anything, uh, Alistair, is there anything you would particularly, you're on the podcast. You've been a fan for a while. <laughs> what do you want to talk about? You're asking about? for compliments? <laughs> I am asking for compliments, yes. I love this podcast and have, well, I would, <laughs> I, I'd love to piggyback on what Chess was saying about, it is like so many of like the uh, foot in the door jobs that you get in the industry are yeah these jobs which are extremely inaccessible. Like I was in a writer's room last week where we had a note taker, which is typically an entry level job for someone wanting to break in as a TV writer. And the note taker, they have to be actively listening to everything everyone says. So they're kind of like a court transcriptionist, but they have to be creative enough to know what people may mean when they're saying something or calling back to something and have like a curatorial eye. And they like, I we all went on our little breaks and then the note taker had to like work through the breaks to do the notes. And then they also have to like, edit the notes that they made in real time and so they'd send it through at like 8 p.m that night so it ended up being a what's like 10 a.m to 8 p.m 10 hour work day <laughs> without breaks constant typing and that is like a typical entry level thing and I, you know as like the reason i wanted to be a writer 
was because it's meant to be easy. <laughs> Anyone who's ever shaked my hand can attest to how soft my hands are. I haven't done a day of work in my life. I'm attracted to just being like able to, you know, it's ideas and creativity and stuff like that. But then there are these weird requirements that, you know, if you want to break into TV, you have to be like a runner, which even if you're not literally running, which you have to be able to do a lot of the time, you also need to have a driver's license, uh, which I can't do. <laughs> um, and you need to like these little things. And so I think it is, I think the industry would do well to think more laterally as well, because I think the industry has a hard time like translating talent and success in other more accessible fields into a, a more accessible role in the industry. Like Jess, you know, they had to Google how to write an episode of television, but had been writing for years and were very talented. Mm -hmm. And so the Cates recognised that and they were like, let's give you a co-writing opportunity in a way which is accessible to you. And I think like productions now, I think hopefully are looking more to, you know, places like theatre for writers, which is a much more financially accessible way as well. Like going to VCA is expensive and then trying to make your own short film is expensive in a way where, you know, writing a play and then doing like a small run at La Mama is still expensive, but not that comparatively or whatever. Mm. And, or people who are like, they're looking, yeah, like, I think the dream is that the TV industry has, like, the lateral creativity to accept that not everyone is going to take the same path of grinding as a runner and then, you know, they work their way up to best boy and then they, best you know, they're boy. up all night writing, best like, a spec person. script while they're yeah. working all day and they're pounding coffee and... Yeah, I... I bet, anyway. Yeah, they probably all think that's a great way to do it because that's the way they did it too exactly. like i did the hard yards to coming up oh this way gosh. but the fact is that if yeah. they change you know they only want disabled people in the industry if disabled people can fit themselves in and push themselves to be able-bodied or able-minded you know to have the bodies and minds of for that period of time that they're there on set or they're in the writer's room they have to be like a non-disabled person yeah. and that means they have to push themselves which might mean that they're pain flaring outside of the writer's room or they're you know, taking extra meds to get through or, you know, they're... Um, but, I mean, there would be lots of people who are shut out of the industry because, you know, because of kids or because they're looking after their parents or um, because, you know, there are lots of reasons why you might not be able to fit into the, the way the industry is right now. Yeah. Um, so it will benefit everybody, not just disabled people. I mean, mostly I mm. care about it benefiting disabled people, but it will benefit everybody if we change the way that it works. Yeah, and, and TV, oh, sorry. sorry, but just like TV by definition is an art form which is like the synergy of creativity and like technical know-how. It's like we're shooting like day for night or, you know, someone's mocking up a spaceship, you know, in like a one hour turnaround with like the art director or whatever, or they're turning like a 21st century building into like a 1960s Ms. Fisher groovy. Th and it's like the, the industry is so equipped at creating magic out of very like real practical solutions, which is what access is. And so it's just shocking to me. It's like TV should be the industry that's the most accessible in my opinion. All right, I'll pay that. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, that's an applause break, I feel. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I'm Thank interested. You. We haven't got much time left. Sorry. But we've made... No, no, no. Don't apologise. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, we've mainly talked about behind the scenes, which was really important to me, because I feel like a lot of time when you talk about disability representation, you're talking about, like, what you're seeing on screen. It's the most visible to us, like, when an able-bodied actor plays a wheelchair user... And that's something that, like, you know, we see them later on the red carpet walking. We know that that, per we know that, like, Eddie Redmayne isn't really, like, you know, mm. disabled or whatever. And it's more visible to us. But, I mean, I, I wonder if, like, there would, if you, if you both think, you're more experienced than I am in this, but, like, do you think that if we have more disabled people, like, literally just in the industry, if we're going to get better storytelling that way? Or, if, or maybe that's too optimistic. I don't know. 
well, we are just better in every way. So, I mean, it makes yeah. sense that we would get better storytelling. So, yeah. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Say the truth, you know? <laughs> yeah. And I do also think it's like the writing and that representation thing is so connected. Like, I feel like abled people's view of disability is like, it's a trauma that happens to you. So they're only interested in depicting it if they can depict like the normal sea that's disrupted, like that could be me. So you have to necessarily show the before they acquire their disability and then their triumphant <laughs> overcoming their disability. Like that's the shape of story that they're comfortable in telling. Or they which die. means that you cast yeah. or they die. They die and inspire an abled person. Yeah. But yeah, it's like I don't know, which means that you have to cast an abled actor to show the before because they see disability as like a horrific before and after and then I get yeah. they die so or mad not. about this. I literally think about this all the time, even though it happened over 10 years ago, but there was an episode of Pack to the Rafters. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was more than an episode. They introduced a character who was like one of the characters' brother, right? And he was <laughs> he was meant to make the, the main character who was like the, the really hunky love interest seem more relatable because he was so nice to his disabled brother. But you had this character who had cerebral palsy um, they, they cast a person without cerebral palsy, like an able-bodied guy, to play this character. Yeah. And he is literally, like, the character always has, to say, has a cerebral palsy when you see him, except for one dream sequence, obviously. No. No. Yeah, you know where it's going. And they just show him happily walking into a party and looking like, oh, oh my god, I actually oh. love myself now because I, I don't look disabled. And oh my god, I'm... And it's literally, I mean, that show has be, been around so long that they just rebooted it, and I'm still mad. <laughs> and yeah. I will die mad about that dream <laughs> sequence. And they took a job away from an actor with cerebral palsy who yeah. would have done it, A, like, no offense to the actor, I'm sure he did the best he could, but, like, I actually don't know. Maybe oh, he's terrible. That guy. Yeah, yeah. That guy. Yeah. <laughs> don't be so magnanimous. Fuck that guy. He should have known I better. I don't know him. Maybe he's awful. Um, <laughs> but you know, they took took a job away from a cere someone with cerebral palsy, and all of us here sitting on the stage have um, multiple intersections of marginalization. Uh, you know, so um, it's not you know it's not just that. It's like you know it's not just about disability. If you let more disabled people in, you're getting such a big variety of people. That's all. I think I'm just mad about the packs just, of the rafters. I just did a script um, kind of consultancy thing for a TV show, and they were like, "Oh, we, you know, we think we can cast someone um, disabled, but you know, can you give us a bit of a a rundown on um, the issues around casting disabled actors or non-disabled actors for disabled roles and how it works and kind of the, a bit of don't they have Google an idea of the landscape well no it was great because they're getting someone disabled who knows more about it to to con consult to advise them on it which was great okay. um, and basically you know I was like you know you can look at these shows um, you know we've just recently and now I'm gonna forget the name of the actor and the show uh, Oh my goodness, I'm having one of those moments. MCU, um, Hawkeye, and Echo. Oh. Echo. So yeah. um, the actress playing Echo um, was never an actor before um, that movie, but they cast her in that movie. And they did a call out and found an actor who was so good that they're now creating her own TV show around that character. And that's someone awesome. who had never acted before and is good enough to be in an MCU mo movie and spin off TV series. Um, you look at Stranger Things, where they've cast a disabled actor. It wasn't written for a disabled person, but the actor was good enough that, or was right for that role, and so they wrote his disability into the show. Um, you know, and so I was saying, look, you can write a script and be a little bit flexible and find an awesome disabled person for this role and then write their disability in and adjust it a bit. Or if this specific disability is important to you, then you can find someone who hasn't done the job and make it happen. So, if, and if no one ever does that kind of creative casting or that, you know, goes that extra step or that little tiny extra step to make sure that it's authentically cast, then nothing will ever change. And we've seen that actually quite a few Australian productions are doing, you know, are doing a good job of casting authentically now. 
It's great. We're seeing a sea change. Oh God, sorry to reference that show. Uh, <laughs> I did not intend to do that. Sorry, we're actually about we're about out of time. But thank you. Thank. I just want to thank Alistair Baldwin and Jess Healy Walton so much for being my guests at the first live show of Just a Spoonful. I want to thank everyone in the audience for coming. So happy to have you here. Thank you, Glenda, our Auslan interpreter. Thank you to our remote live captioner. Thank you to the Wheeler Center uh, for providing an accessible venue. Um, thank you to the City of Melbourne for that arts grant. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Give disabled people money. <laughs> Woo! What a great night to end on. Uh. Honestly, if we had more money, we'd be making more movies and TV shows and books and all sorts of things. So uh, 10 seconds left. Uh, okay, five seconds each. Go. Um, um, I guess, <laughs> I think you can buy the episode on iTunes, right? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, what? That's it, we're out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry I threw that on. You were both uh, <laughs> Um, thank you so oh, much. Dear. That's, that's, that's our time. Thank you so much for coming. It's so nice to see people in person. Um, and, um, Oh, I should have promoted the podcast. Dang it. Yes. Um, yeah. I feel like it's implied. I hope so. Um, you can listen uh, on any platform where you find podcasts. Uh, we're on Spotify now. Uh, so, yeah, Just a Spoonful. I'm Caitlin Blythe. I don't know if I said that during this whole thing. Anyway. Again, I think it's implied. Uh, it's, that's my face. So, thank you so much. And um, I'm going to be hanging around. So come and say hello. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you all for coming.